house of the Lord this morning. Come on, can we all stand to our feet all across the room? Amen, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together like this. know that you have won the battle. We have victory when we call on your name. So we thank you for that. We worship you, Jesus. Doors do 
declare it.
Thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. You can go ahead and remain standing. I hope that when you came in today that you were given the elements of communion. And these elements represent the, the body, the broken body, and shed blood of Jesus. Most of you have been, if you've been here the last couple of weeks. You know that we're starting a brand new series today, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And there's actually quite a lot that is said about tables in the Bible. But maybe the most important table of them all, or at least right near the top, is the table that Jesus invited his closest followers to. That gathered uh, just prior to his crucifixion. And, and on that night, Jesus took the bread, the Bible says. In, in fact, would you just take back that top little layer there and, and there's a little wafer and... and uh, you see that little wafer there, and it's symbolic of the body of Christ. And Jesus took the bread. It's a very intimate setting. Not all of his followers, but just his closest disciples and apostles. And Jesus said, it. this is my body, which is broken for you. He was forecasting what was just right ahead of him. And he said, and take, eat, this is my body. So let's partake of the bread together. Remember what Jesus did for us. And then it says, and he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant and my blood. And again, Jesus in the cup was pointing symbolically to his own shed blood. Why do we have communion? We do so because the scriptures tell us to. That although the crucifixion of Jesus was 2,000 plus years now, that every time we take of the bread, it, it represents his body. And every time we drink the juice, we remember that Jesus spilled his blood for us. And Jesus said, take, drink of the cup. So let's do that together. This next song, why don't you just use it to express your love and your worship to Jesus and, and just remember what Jesus did for you on the cross. Let's worship him. Can we do it?
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give him praise. Can we do it? Jesus, we thank you that you bring us into this place where we can worship you. And God, we could never say thank you enough. We could take beginning right now and for the rest of this week and the rest of this month and the rest of this year and give you praise, but it would never quite be enough for all that you did for us. Jesus, we're grateful that you took upon yourself all of our sin and you went to the cross and you died in our place so that we can have life, as you said, that we might have it more abundantly, fullness of life. Jesus, thank you for doing all of that for us. We give you great praise. Thank you for what you're going to do in all of us today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said a great big amen. Well, before you see it, turn around, say hi to a few people. Would you do it? Just let them know you're glad to see them. Well, we welcome you to the service today. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being with us. We're delighted that you are here. How many of you know we've got some beautiful weather going on this weekend? Isn't it incredible? You know, if this weather keeps up, people are going to start moving to Florida. I don't know if you know that or not. But that may happen. That, it could happen. No, it is happening all the time in droves. Well, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you for being with us. We welcome back the church family. And let me say a big special uh, hello to all of our new friends. We're delighted that you are here. And this is what we want you to feel. We want you to feel the love of God. And we mean that because God loves you in a way, by the way, you can't even wrap your mind around how much, in fact, nobody can love you the way that God loves you. Nobody, nobody, nobody. But we hope that you feel the love of God. And we want you to feel our love as well. We're delighted that you're here. You're not an intruder. You're not a visitor. You're an honor guest. And we want you to feel welcomed and wanted. We're delighted that you're here with us today. We hope you'll come back and be with us again and again. Uh, in fact, right after the service, if you're a first-time guest, you can go out to Guest Central. That's that big blue tent out front. And uh, stop by, see one of our team members. Let them know you're a first-time guest. They'll give you a little gift. Just as our way of saying thank you uh, for coming out and being with us today. Let me mention that our middle schoolers have an option. Uh, you can stay in here with your family if you like. That's fine. Or if you want to join up with some other middle schoolers, with CJ and Alexis and their team, you can do that for the balance of that hour. So that's available to you. Wanted you uh, to know that. Also, let me mention a couple of things. We've got a big men's serve day coming up at the Dream Center this coming weekend, an opportunity to uh, help serve the under-resourced uh, people of our community. So guys, take advantage of that. You see a little bit more information on the screen right there. Then here's what we're going to do in July. We're going to take some teams with us uh, on a great, great missions trip uh, we're going to Colombia, Armenia, Colombia, and we're going to take a medical team, and we're going to take a dental team, and we're going to take a construction team, and uh, we're going to take a kids evangelism team. So if you're interested uh, about that, you want to join us on that trip, you can call the missions office, and they can give you lots and lots of details uh, concerning that. Let me also mention, so you can put this date on your calendar, uh, Sharon Blackburn her mom, also the mom of Joe Jasso, the, uh, the grandmother of Julie Roth. Uh, Julie and Craig's a part of our church, have been from the beginning. And that memorial service is coming up a week from this Saturday. A lot of you know the, the Blackburn and the Jasso family, so we just wanted you to have that day 
and that information. Please be praying for Sharon and for all of her family, for all the family members in this great, great loss. Uh, one other thing I want to quickly mention to you is we are so excited. Every time we have baptism, uh, that's a celebration time. What, what is water baptism? Water baptism is when somebody goes public ab about their commitment to Jesus. How many of you know you can receive Jesus anywhere? You can receive Jesus at home. You can receive Jesus. You can pray and receive Jesus at work. You can pray and receive Jesus at church. You can even pray and receive Jesus driving in your car. But if you do, keep your eyes open, all right? So if you're praying and you keep looking around, but you can receive Jesus. But the point is, at some point, you got to go public about it. And they did it in the Bible. Every baptism in the Bible was a baptism by immersion. Baptism was so important that even Jesus was baptized. And so we're going to celebrate after both of these worship hours today. Do you know we've got about 30 people being baptized today? Isn't that credible? You ought to shout and clap and celebrate that. That's huge. And so we're going to ask you to come to the party out back. I'll give you directions at the end of the service because you wouldn't want to have a birthday party and nobody show up for your party. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be bad? You have a birthday party and you're like, wow, it's my birthday party and it's a spiritual per birthday that we're celebrating. But it's my birthday party, but nobody came. So we're going to go out afterwards, out back. It's a beautiful day. You know that already. And then every time somebody is baptized and comes up out of the water, we're going to cheer. We're going to shout. We're going to clap. We're going to celebrate. And it's going to be a great, great time. So I hope you'll do that. Let me say thank you to all of the church family for continuing to be faithful and honoring Jesus with a full tie. Thank you for being consistent. A lot of you uh, may not know this, but every single month, our church has the privilege of supporting 250-plus missionaries scattered around the world. We support 48 different organizations right here at home, home uh, efforts and initiatives that we're engaged in every single month, and we're able to do it because of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Whether you text to give or you give online or you give in the bucket at the end of the service, thank you for your faithfulness. Now turn your attention to the screen. Good morning and welcome to Victory on this first Sunday in April. It's a great day to be in church and here are a few things you need to know about this week. Victory Student Church is hosting a fine arts preview night on Wednesday, April 17th at 6.30 p.m. in the Family Life Center at Victory's North Lakeland campus. This is an opportunity for parents and all those who love the arts to experience a wide variety of performances by our very own students. There's no cost to attend, so come out to be inspired and to encourage our teams before they head off to the district competitions in Orlando. Victory Church and the Joy FM are excited to welcome We Are Messengers with special guests Ben Fuller and Jonathan Trailer live in concert on Saturday, April 20th at 7 p.m. Take a look. A night of music that'll bring you joy. Compassion presents We Are Messengers, Where the Joy Is Tour, with special guest Ben Fuller and Jonathan Trailer. Saturday, April 20th in Lakeland at Victory Church. We Are Messengers, Where the Joy Is Tour, with Ben Fuller and Jonathan Trailer. Tickets for this incredible show start at just $25, but for those who would like a more memorable experience, you can upgrade to VIP and enjoy early entry, a Q&A session with the artists, and an exclusive tour souvenir that you can't get anywhere else. Visit victorylakeland.org slash events to purchase your ticket today. Set a reminder to attend this year's annual business meeting on Monday, April 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Everyone is invited, but we ask for members to make a special effort to attend as we'll be looking over the past year and prayerfully voting for new board members. To make it possible for everyone to attend, we're offering childcare for newborns through fifth grade. Don't miss this opportunity to be a part of the life-changing ministry happening right here at Victory. And finally, Victory offers a wide range of classes and support groups covering practical life issues, prayer, and spiritual development. Some new classes this semester include Help is Here by Max Lucado, The Art of Marriage, Faith and Company, Business on Purpose, and even a class for those new to Victory who feel like they've been stuck in a spiritual rut called What's Next. Most classes begin this Wednesday, April 10th, with others meeting on Sundays and throughout the week at our North Lakeland campus, providing multiple opportunities to build community, pray, and grow together. If you've not yet connected with a class, look through the Victory Life brochure you received today to find the right fit for you and your family. 
Thanks again for being a part of today's service. And remember, you can get information about all that's happening at Victory and watch or listen to previous services by downloading our app to your phone or TV. Well, it's been a busy week, so I think I'm just going to sit down and teach today. <laughs> Maybe not. It has been a busy week, but uh, we're starting a brand new series today that I'm very, very excited about. We're going to talk about this table a little bit, and I'm just glad that you are here. Uh, several of you, if you've been around our church uh, for some time, you know that here just a few weeks ago, uh, I had a little surgery, a shocker to me that I needed a surgery in the first place, but then it all made sense because you cannot pitch for the Atlanta Braves as many years as I did and not have an injury. Okay, maybe not. Maybe that's not how my injury happened, but an injury nevertheless, it had to be, uh, had to be repaired, done remarkably well, all of that. I'm doing great, by the way, and thank you for all of your prayers. Uh, except for football season, I'm not like a mega, mega TV watcher, um, and so I do love to read a lot. I'm always reading any g given time, a, you know, a, a book about leadership, a theological book, a book about health or fitness, a novel. Generally, I've got about four types of books going at one time, but um, I picked up this book right here. It happened to be at the house, but, you know, it was stuck away in a drawer, actually, and so I was looking for something to read because I couldn't really do anything else, especially for the first couple of weeks. And I picked up this book, and I cannot even begin to tell you the impact that this book made on my life. You know, I've, I've read a lot of books, but this, I, I couldn't find myself not putting it, I wanted to constantly read it. And I was absorbing, and by the way, it wasn't because I was medicated. I was off of pain medication by then. <laughs> and I just kept reading it, and God kept speaking to me again and again and again. And it was out of that I had this realization that, you know what, that I would not only be the one that could benefit from, from a book like that, but maybe all of our church family would as well. And so we brought a lot of copies uh, today, and they're available. We just turn around and sell them for the same price that we purchased them for. And so you can get a copy of yours uh, right after the service. We're starting a series. It's going to be four weeks long, and um, there's no way that we can cover everything that's in the book in, in four weeks. So there's a lot of things that you can read on your own. But let me just say this. And I know that just by saying this, it's going to seem quite melodramatic when I say it, but I mean it. And that is, I believe this message series that starts like right now and for the next three weeks, and I hope you won't miss a single week. I don't want you to miss. If you're out of town and, you, you know, I just did a 48-hour trip to Georgia and back, got back yesterday at 3 o'clock, if you can get back, because this is what I, sounds melodramatic, I know, I give that up. But I believe that this series is going to change your life. And I don't say that because I'm preaching this series. I'll tell you why I say it. I say it because this series and all of our series have scriptures in, a, in them. The basis of every message series we ever do has that. But this one especially is overflowing with the word of God. You're going to see it every single week. You're going to hear it every week. You're going to speak it every week. I'm going to ask you to read some verses with me even today. You're going to understand it because we're going to unpack it. And then I'm praying that you're going to apply it to your life. And so I believe, melodramatic, I know, but I believe this series is going to change your life. But here's a caveat. If you will allow it to. But you've got to allow it to. You've got to go ahead, just like I did, sitting in that chair, couldn't go anywhere. And I just said, God, here's my heart. It's open. What do you want to teach me? What do you want me to learn? And we're going to do that together. So let's get rolling with our primary passage that will live with us for all four weeks in some form or fashion. It is the most well-known of all 150 Psalms and one of the most recognized passages in all of the Bible. You're going to see it on the screen. In fact, this would be a great place because a lot of you know it by heart. And maybe you memorized it in one particular translation that's a little bit different. This, in, this one is actually the New International Version. But let's 
all read it together. Full voice, even if you don't have it memorized, well, you got it on the screen. We can read it together. You're going to help me? Wave at me if you're going to help me. You ready? Let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will feel no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And every part of that is just incredible. The most uh, famous of all Psalms where God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm preparing a table for you. It is a place for you and, and your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's like God is saying to us in this psalm, right out of the beginning, Jesus himself is the one. The Lord is my shepherd. It's Jesus who is the one that is watching over my life, and I have real life in him, and in him I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. And, and then it goes on to say, and you read it with me so you know it, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, what is that part of this psalm matter so much? He, he mates, and sometimes we have this attitude that says, well, nobody's <laughs> going to make me do anything, but he mates me. He forces me, if you will, to lie down in green pastures. Why? Because the green pastures is a representative of rest and peace and solitude, and God, like nobody else, knows this frenetic pace that you and I keep that is, that is unsustainable and often unhealthy. And so what, is, what does he do? The good shepherds, Jesus, who loves me, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He guides me along the right paths. He's given me guidance in my life. I, I'm not going through my life aimless. I'm not going through life all by myself. I'm not alone because the shepherd is with me. He guides me in the right paths. He's with me. He shows me. And then it goes on to say, even though I walk through the darkest valley. Some of you maybe remember Psalm 23 out of the translation. Several translations says that this way, that he walks with me. He's with me through the valley of the shadow of death. But then it goes on to say, I will not fear your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We'll touch on that in just a few moments. It's amazing what is indicated there. And then you prepare a table for me. You prepare a table for me. And, and the irony, the irony of Psalm 23, and we'll get to this as well. You, God, prepare a table for me, for the shepherd and for me, in the presence. Did you catch it? In the presence of my enemies. How many of you know we need to talk about that? Of all places in the presence of our enemies. Now, there are various sections of Psalm 23 that we're going to be talking about there in this series. But it is this table that will influence a lot of our attention. It is a table that has been prepared by the Lord our shepherd. It is a table, and I know, you know, and I emphasized it then, but let me talk about it a, a little bit uh, more. You call it the location of the table. You, you, God, you prepared this table before me in the presence of my friends. How many of you know it doesn't say that? You prepared a table before me in the presence of my friends. How many of you know that'd be great because how many of you love hanging out with your friends? It but it doesn't say that. You prepare a table before me in the presence of of my family members, does it say that? You prepare a table before me, you know, in, in the presence of my golfing, fishing, hunting buddies, does it say that? Does it say you prepared the table before me in the presence of all the girls that I hang out with and we, we do things together, girls from work and uh, 
girls from, uh, you know, church and girls that we hang out with and sports and other things bring us uh, together, whatever uh, those things are they bring. No, nope, not, not there, but in the presence of my enemies. And we're going to touch on this a little later in this message. But this, this table, and this is what we've got to capture, is in the presence. You know what that means? It means that it's positioned right in the middle of the battle. The battle. And how many of you know that in reality, I want you to think about this with me, in reality, how many of you know that that is where most of our life is lived, right in the middle of the battle? How many, wave at me if you believe that. Now, let me just say this, if you're newer to our church, I should have mentioned this little, this little uh, law, this little rule, this little whatever you, you want to call it that we have here. It's dark in here, and the seats are comfortable, and they recline. So we would say to people... If you catch your friend nodding off during the service, you get to smack them. <laughs> but you have to follow it up. When they wait back up, you just, a light smack, don't get too carried away. And when they look up and they've got that look like, well, what did you do that for? You just look at him and say, in Jesus' name. That, all right, so you, you know, I did that because you needed it. You need, how many of you know I'm just kidding? And you're, all right, but I, I do want you with me. But this is where, how many of you know that? Wave at me if you know this is where most of life is lived, in the middle of the battle. In the middle of the battle. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, and listen carefully because you, you want to be sure that you're raising your hand about the right thing. How many of you have a perfect life? Go ahead and raise your hand. You've got a perfect life. You have a life that is pain-free. Your life is stress-free. It is worry-free. It is tear-free. It is sad-free. It is disappointment-free. How many of you live that kind of life? You don't, and I don't either. None of us live that kind of life. But a moment of clarity before we move on. At the end of the day, you know it says, you know that God prepares this table, not in the presence of our family members or friends, but in the presence of our enemies. But I do need to make mention of this. We need to understand, and, and this is applicable, and it needs to be stated here so there's no confusion. No confusion. People are not our enemies. How many of you know that? People, that's not what it's talking about. People are not our enemies. Not even your boss. Not even your ex. Not even your former business partner. Not even your crazy acting sister-in-law. How many of you know I was careful with the language on that one? <laughs> crazy acting. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, it validates it, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil. And if you truly, truly want to know who your enemy is, and I'm sure that you do, and most all of you already do, then we see the identity of our enemy in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And you did so great last time. Would you read another verse with me? You ready? You're going to help me out. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us it identifies our enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So who's our enemy? Who is it? The devil. And the scripture said that he's prowling about all the time. And he's up to no good. And, and he's looking for people to devour. And he doesn't have a seat at the table because when God prepared this table in the presence of our enemies, God prepared it for the good shepherd and for you and I to be seated at. But our enemy is always prowling about. He's always looking for an angle and we'll get to this. He's always looking to pull up a chair and to invade the space that was intended for just Jesus and us. And the time that we have remaining, and it will not take us long, I want to spotlight rather rapidly four things that uh, really flow out of what we're talking about in what is an intro weekend. And again, I hope you'll be back with us for week two and week three and week four. But first of all, in the book, Giglio talks about what he calls, and I love this, and we'll touch on it briefly. He talks about hanging on, you'll see this on the screen, hanging on to an even though, even though I will fail. 
and even though I will fail. And that shows up in a lot of different places in the scriptures. It really does. It shows up way back in the Old Testament. And many of you remember the story of, of Daniel, and this is out of the book of Daniel, but in this case, it is not Daniel. It is some of his friends. It is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they are worshipers of God. They are worshipers of God. They serve the one true God, but they're in a, a place and a culture that is in opposition to their faith. If you ever sometimes feel like, hey, it's not always popular to be a Christian now and not like it used to be, well, let me just say, although that may be incredibly true, what you and I may encounter uh, does not compare in the least to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because at least in our nation, uh, we can worship God uh, freely. But in the nation that they were in and in the culture that they had and the king they, they had, which was Nebuchadnezzar, they could not worship the one true God. In fact, this egocentric king Nebuchadnezzar said, you can worship nobody but me. And he had this massive image of himself, golden image, massive. And he said, you can't worship God. You can't worship anybody but me. And if you choose to do otherwise, the consequence is going to be really, really bad for you. It will get you physically thrown into a fiery furnace. So they've got that pressure on them. But they had no intention. you got to understand it. About And they're just young guys. They're young adults. They're not like seasoned professionals. They're not middle-aged. They're not like veterans in the faith. They're young adult guys. And I want you to look at what they said. This is Daniel chapter 3, uh, verses 17 and 18. Look at these uh, verses with me. This is what it says. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Look at this highlighted phrase. But even if he does not, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Even though, even though they chose to possess this I will faith. How many of you know that's incredible? How many of you want that kind of faith in your life? Even though... I'm not going to cower. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to cave. Think about, this is Old Testament. Think about Paul and Silas. And, and they were in prison, not for doing anything wrong. They hadn't committed any crimes. There was a young slave girl that was being abused by her owners and taken advantage of. And she was bringing them much profit. And, and she would just follow around Paul all the time. And she was demon-possessed. It was a sad and tragic case. But, but Paul, uh, he just... You know, he, he causes her, he just demands that these evil spirits come out of this girl. And when it happens, she loses her ability to do this fortune telling that she was doing that brought a lot of money and a lot of gain to her owners. And they are so ticked off that they have Paul and Silas hauled into prison. They hadn't done anything wrong. They had done everything right. Now, how many of you have to admit, this is not a trick question, but how many of you would have to admit it would have been a little bit easy to become a little bit frustrated with God when you were doing all of the right things and it lands you in prison? You're like, I was doing the right stuff. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just did, you know, this slave delivered from demonic activity, and we're doing good. We're going, and it lands us in prison. But they don't complain. They don't, they had this, even though I will kind of faith, and rather than complain and bemoan their situation and, and fault God with where they are, instead they sing and they praise and they rejoice. It's an even though I still will have faith. How many of you want that kind of faith? Look at these verses. This is out, uh, this is out of your most favorite uh, Bible uh, book, uh, Old Testament book, Habakkuk. I know that you have it memorized, don't you? All of it from beginning to end. But there's two verses in chapter 3 that I want you to see. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the crop fails and the fields produce no food. How many of you know this is a bad situation? <laughs> Things are not going right here. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior, even though I will have that kind of faith. Secondly, let's talk about trusting in the good shepherd. Remember this phrase from verse 1? You can say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's say it again together. 
The Lord is my shepherd. Just so you know, he wants to shepherd your life. He does. He wants to shepherd your life. And God sent Jesus, we know, in, into the world, pay off our sin debt in full. And let me just assure you, Jesus is not distracted. Jesus is not distant. The reality about the shepherd of Psalm 23 is that he is present and attentive. You remember this phrase from Psalm 23 that the Lord, our shepherd, he leads his sheep. It, it talks about he, he makes us lie down in green pastures, but he leads us. And maybe you've read this or quoted it before, but you've never thought about it. He leads us to quiet waters. And we say, well, well, why would that matter? But if you were in that culture and you were around sheep, then you would have this understanding that when a sheep is thirsty, it seats out any water, any water, anywhere, not quiet waters necessarily, but even a roaring river to get their, their thirst quenched. Sheep, the reference to us, us as sheep is on. Uh, undisturbed. It's, in, it's very, it's intentional. Uh, the scriptures use a reflection of sheep uh, toward us for a reason. Uh, Giglio points out in the book, and you'll see this, and, and when the expression for us as sheep is used in scripture, it's not necessarily complimentary because sometimes sheep need guidance. Sometimes sheep lack discernment and are impulsive and often irrational. Sometimes sheep lack self-awareness. And so in Psalm 23, when it says that the shepherd will lead, and David, how many of you know what David did? David is the author of Psalm 23. How many of you know what David did vocationally? How many of you know what he was? He was a shepherd. And, and he knew the, the importance of, of leading a sheep to quiet waters. As I mentioned a moment ago, if a sheep got really thirsty, it was going to drink water from anywhere. And it didn't have to be quiet waters. It could be like a raging river. And how many of you know, you know, if a sheep doesn't think about that and just plunges their head into the water, which they would do because they weren't just going to sip the water. How many of you know that five sweaters worth of wool, when it is soaking wet, 15 pounds of wool can cause problems? And that little sheep just thought, hey, I'm just thirsty. And it's not quiet waters. And I just plunge. Next thing you know, that, that sheep is floating down, down the river. He leads me to quiet waters. And that matters a whole lot. Take a look at verse 4, Psalm 23, and verse 4. This is what it says. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Again, some translation says the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. I love it that, and it's still on the screen. So take a look. at. I love it that the verse reads this way. Even though I walk. Say it with me, through, through, even though I walk through the valley. How many of you are glad that, that even though from time to time, all of us, none of us are immune to this really, how many of you know that even though we walk into the valley, we will eventually walk out of the valley? Even though I walk through, it doesn't say that we stay immersed there. We're not stuck there. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though, and I, I, I enter it, but I'm coming out on the end, other side of it. And because God is with me, I will not fear. And, and I say that, and my, my heart feels compassion toward any of you right now that at this moment, see, all of us will walk into the valley and we'll walk out of the valley but sometimes we're there for a season, and you may be in that season where you're in a, in a valley. And I want to just say, I am so, so sorry that that's the reality of, for your life. But this is what I do know. I know that God is with you. You say, well, I'm in a valley. I've, you know, Jeff, here's why I'm in, in the valley. I've, I've had the death, you know, the death of a relationship. A relationship that I thought had a great potential to it. And, you know, the death of of a relationship or, or, or the death of a dream. Nothing, nothing is unsettling as the death of a dream or, 
or, or maybe it's the loss of a family member. Maybe it's the loss of hope. Everybody at some point walks through grief and through discouragement and disappointment. But the psalmist said, because the shepherd is with me, I will fear no evil for you are with me. How many of you know that Jesus is with you when you walk into the valley? How many of you know that? And Jesus is with you the whole time you're in the valley. And how many of you know it's Jesus that's going to bring you out on the other side of the valley, even though I walk through the valley? And then it says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And those are very intentional words as well. Not just a rod, not just a staff, but the shepherd. And again, David is writing this, and David would be all familiar with these instruments, the staff and the rod. And the staff would be, you know, I, I talked to you about that, uh, you know, 15 pounds of wool soaking wet. And how many of you know that sheep would just quickly disappear, but that staff could just retrieve and, and would be used to retrieve and bring that sheep to safety. Your rod and your staff. The rod, you know what the rod was used for? The rod was used for predators and enemies to the sheep. And it's just like Jesus who oftentimes beats back the enemy that's trying to find inroads into our life. There's so many things we could talk about there, but let me keep, keep moving. Thirdly, there's a table in the presence of my enemies. Did you know that sometimes in the Bible, this term table is used to speak of presence? And I'll show you a verse concerning that in just a moment. A lot of times... This understanding of, of table in the Bible speaks of, of peace, the presence of God, the peace of God. Sometimes the table speaks of salvation, and every Jewish listener would understand the significance of being invited to someone's table, just like the, the good shepherd Jesus who invites us personally to his table. I, I need to keep moving, but I, I do want to take just a second to mention in the Old Testament tabernacle. It's a study that you can do later on your own. But in the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was a place where sinful people could meet with the righteous and holy God. And in the Old Testament tabernacle was a table. And this, this table was a place, again, it reflected peace and salvation and presence. In fact, I wish I had more time to talk about it, but just take a quick look at this verse, Exodus 25 and verse 30. But put the bread of the presence on where? What are these two words? On this table to be before me at all times. The bread of presence. The bread of presence. And that's really how God has designed this table when you think about it. God prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. Uh, a table for the good shepherd, for Jesus, and for us. And this table, it, this table represents his peace and his presence. That even though you and I are sometimes in the middle of the battle, because as I mentioned to you, that's where most of life is lived. But how many of you know that even in the middle of the battle, God can give us peace that passes all understanding? Peace and presence, even when things around us are difficult. And he always makes sure that we're well taken care of. I didn't see any of this till this morning when I got here, but while I'm here and I had to rush through breakfast, so if you don't mind. And this table is just for us and Jesus. How many of you, you got that already? But fourthly, you and I have to identify our enemy. Because our, our enemy, he's real. He's real. And we need to understand that about our enemy. This table was always intended to have two chairs. But the enemy, the devil, is always lurking around. Remember what it says, 1 Peter 5, 8. He's always prowling around looking for somebody to devour. And this table is just intended. It's like Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to give you provision for every, everything. I know you can't see it from here, but everything that, 
If you could only see these brownies, you would want one. I'm just telling you right now. Are these brownies right here? Maybe between services. If you're really sweet to me between services, I'll sneak you a brownie, all right? Maybe nobody will miss it for the 11 o'clock service. I don't want to mess anything up. But the enemy wants to pull up a seat at the table. And, and let me just say this about the way that he, that he words. He doesn't come rushing in with, with evil and with darkness. He just sort of eases up to our table. Hey, mind, mind if I have a seat here? Wow. Wow, this is, this is great. Can't stay long. I, I know this is for like you and Jesus and such, but hey, I'll, I'll just be here for a moment. And again, how many of you know he's not going to rush in with this red suit and a pitchfork and a point to tell? I, I'll show you the way he comes in. Look, look on the screen. Look at this verse right here. And we know it to be true. Look at this verse. Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. Hey, I'm, I'm one of the good guys. Hey, I'm, I'm, hey you know, just, just a minute. John 10.10, 10, this is what Jesus said about him. Look at this on the screen. John 10.10, 10, this is Jesus' words. The thief's purpose, and Jesus said, we better be crystal clear on this. The thief's purpose is to, read it with me, is to steal and kill and destroy. So he just pulls up a place at the table. How you doing? Let's talk about that, that boss of yours for just a moment. He's a jerk. You know, he's, he's a jerk. You should, have, you should have told him. How many of you know the enemy will do this kind of stuff? Don't give the enemy a seat at your, he, he's, you know what, I'm surprised you've not told him off by now. You probably, I, I know, you want to, you know, you want to be salt and light and stuff, but listen, a person can, can only take so much. I mean, you just, do what you will. I mean, it's your call. I don't work there, but just do your, but if I were you, I, I'd tell him off this week. I don't care what anybody else thought. How many of you know? We start buying into that. How many of you know we've just given the enemy a seat at our table? Wave at me. Do you know I'm telling you the truth? How is it around your house these days? Let's talk about it. Honestly, I don't know how you put up with it. I don't. <laughs> you're, you're a better person than I am. I don't know how you put up with it. It's, it's tough. You never thought it. Well, I'm not telling you what. It, it's just I don't think you deserve it. I think you deserve a lot more than what you're getting, but that's for another day. Hey, can we talk about something? How many of you know we start buying into that? We've just given the enemy a seat at our table. How about this one? How about this one? Man, you've been, you've been so faithful to, to, to Jesus. Crazy. Seems like he could have answered that prayer. Huh. You've been praying about that how long? Yeah. Wow. Just seems that if Jesus was as compassionate, as loving, as... Everybody said he would have answered that prayer. Well, yeah, I know you're losing hope. Yeah, I get it. If I had your life circumstances, I'd probably lose hope too. Don't want to meddle in your stuff, but man, that's tough. Yeah. I know you feel like throwing in the towel and you just keep hoping things are going to get better and better and they don't. And you're like incredibly depressed. You know what? If I went through what you've gone through, I'd be depressed all the time and I'd be blaming. Everybody. But, but again, that's your business. That's not mine. How many of you know when you do that, you've just given the enemy a seat at your table? Are you with me on this? How about this one? This is a big one.
sort of silly if you ask me about that sin that's just driving you crazy. Man, I know you feel like it's a big deal, but compared to a lot of what I see, it's nothing compared to what a lot of other people are doing. I don't know why you get so worked up over that sin. I don't, you know, it's just such a small thing. And I know you want to get rid, you want to get rid, you're talking about it, and you want to get victory over it, and you don't want, don't want it to keep you chained in your life anymore. But, but listen, it's so tiny. That sin is driving you crazy. But it's compar- by comparison, it's so little. I don't see a problem with it. I don't know why you're getting so worked up about it, actually. Not that big, big a deal, if you ask me. Just hold. Nobody's perfect. But you do what you got to do. How many of you know that when that happens, you've just given the enemy a seat at your table? Wave at me if you know I'm telling you the truth. And on and on and on we could go. Let me say this to you. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not give a liar and a thief and a murderer a seat at your table. That table's just for you and Jesus. But he comes up, and he's so slick, and he's so smooth. And again, he doesn't come in like, you know, spewing venom and hatred and darkness. He just eases up, hey, let's talk a while. And next thing you know. How many of you, this is, I mean, I'll raise my hand. This has happened to me. And more than once, has this ever happened to anybody but me? I hope it has. Otherwise, I feel really awkward right now. And before we know it, we're like, oh, yeah, he's got a point. You know, we're not saying he, but yeah, yeah. See that? There's some, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Let me share with you. We're out of time. Let me give you a couple of verses, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to close. Uh, John 8, Look at this verse up on the screen. John 8, says, He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 26. It talks about how that we need to escape from the trap of the devil who has taken us captive to do his will. This table, my friends, God is prepared for the good shepherd and for us. Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that the table that you have prepared for us is situated right in the middle of the battle. We know that. But we will continue to hang on to this even though I will kind of faith. Like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, like Paul and Silas, we'll hang on to our faith. We will trust in our good shepherd because he is always present and always sensitive and compassionate toward our needs. We have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that the devil is a liar and he is a thief and a murderer. Jesus, you even said that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come to wreck our lives, and so we will not give him a seat at the table. How many of you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. We're going to do this really, really quick. But how many of you see at least one tiny area of your life where maybe you've allowed the enemy to just sneak up just casually, casually? He's not come in. He's not spewing hate, violence, darkness. He just eases in. How many of you can see at least one area in your life where the enemy's trying to gain a foothold in your life? Just wave at me like this. And that's, that's most all of us. Maybe it is all of us. Don't give the enemy. Why would you let a liar and a thief and a murderer, if you were to say to me, Pastor Jeff, hey, I've got a mass murderer coming over to my house for dinner this week. I would say, have you lost your mind? Don't give a murderer a seat at your table. Don't give a thief a seat at your table. Don't give a liar a seat at your table. And I just pray for you right now that you'll just say, Satan, I resist you. I rebuke you. You have no place in my life. The Bible says resist the devil and he 
will flee. So you need to right away just say, devil, you have no place at my table. I resist you. I rebuke you in Jesus' name, and you must flee. For those of you that you don't know Jesus yet, you don't have the benefit. Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you, but you've never put yourself under the umbrella of God's protection. Listen, you don't want to face the onslaught of the wicked one on your own. He's not more powerful than Jesus. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, but he is stronger than you, and you don't want to face him by yourself. You need Jesus on your side, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus has made provision for you to be in his family and for him to be your your umbrella of protection. But if you're trying to do it on your own, you're going to mess up. You're going to fail. But you need Jesus. Greater is he that is in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And if you just say, Jeff, I'm not a Christian yet. I need Jesus in my life. I know the enemy is real. I know he wants to come against. I believe Jesus when he said that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I need Jesus in my life. I need security in my life. I need protection in my life. I need Jesus And I'm not a Christian yet, but I want to become one. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand real high? Wherever you're at, just lift it up real high. And let me pray with you. Go ahead, everybody stand. Let's stand together. Jesus, we come to you right now. And you can just pray this in your heart and in your mind. And Jesus, hear you. Jesus, I come to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking my sin to the cross. I just, right now, want to invite you to become the Savior and the leader of my life, forgive me of all my sins. Give me a brand new start today. Thank you for dying for me so that I can live for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. How many of you know that the enemy hates it, hates it, hates it, that people are following Jesus in baptism today? He hates it. So we need to celebrate it all the more. If you have kids, pick up your kids first. Our kids team will show you a shortcut back to baptism. Everybody else, we need a lot of people celebrating. When you exit, don't go out the front doors. Go down the hallway to the left, out the doors. Go to the left and around back. You'll see the baptistry. And every time somebody comes up, you love them. You celebrate them. You clap and applaud. Love you, everybody.